then, my son, be strong in grace that is in Christ Jesus. In the things you have heard me say, in the presence of many witnesses, and trust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Join me, join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive the share of the crops. Reflect on what I am saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all of this. Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel, for which I am suffering, even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But God's word is not chained. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they will, they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Here is a trustworthy saying. If we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we disown him, he will also disown us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. Keep reminding them of these things. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. It is of no value and only ruins those who listen. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Avoid godless chatter, because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Their teaching will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have wandered away from the truth. They say that the resurrection has already taken place, and they destroy the faith of some. Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm, sealed with this inscription, The Lord knows those who are his, and everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. In a large house, there are articles not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some are for noble purposes and some for ignoble. If a man cleanses himself from the latter, he will be an instrument for noble purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments, because you know they produce quarrels, and the Lord's servant must not quarrel. Instead, he must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Those who oppose him he must gently instruct, in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth, and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil, who has taken them captive to do his will. Hi, sweetie. <laughs> if you're reading this note, the surgery didn't go very well. And I'm sorry I tried my best to beat this horrible disease, but I guess God had other plans for me. Please don't be mad. Bad things happen in life, and we have to learn to deal with it no matter how much it hurts. Nadine's mom had been diagnosed with stage 4 cancer about a year before. Life will hold challenges for you, and I won't be around to say, but it will be good for you, and even when things seem to be too much, please hold on and remember that you had a mother who loved you more than life itself. It's at this point she gave advice on many different things, just life, being a teenager, boys, beliefs, the unforeseen future. She said, if you have kids someday, make sure they know how much I love them and wanted to be there to see them. You're going to do great in life, and I will be smiling with you through all the important moments, both good and bad. Hang on to those memories and tell everyone you love them as often as you can. Most importantly, enjoy life. Live each day as if it is your last. And remember, I love you more than you will ever know. You say, Jason, that's kind of a dark way to start this amazing Mother's Day holiday. And first, I do want to take a moment to shout out to, to all the moms out there. Men, let's lift it up to thank them for that. Yeah. 
And I also want to shout out to a group of women out there, too, who are invested in pouring out into the next generation. They are giving their time and their energy. And a big, huge thank you to everything you do as well. Let's lift it up for them as well. And I'm not trying to be dark, but when we tell a story like that, that final letter, it, it, at least, it at least means that I can ask one important question, and I think we should ask this question in life. If you had one more letter to write, just one more note that you could write, and you knew it was your last, what would you say? What would be on your mind? What would be most important to you? Because as Pastor Ben brought up and hinted at last week, it's widely expected that, that this second Timothy letter was the final letter Paul ever wrote. This was it. He was in chains at the time he wrote this, soon to die. Most likely chained to a Roman soldier. It was around 63 AD, if you're familiar with history. About 70% of Rome had burnt down. Nero blamed the Christians. And hundreds, if not thousands, of Christians went to their death, including Paul, and oddly enough, including Peter at this time. Paul, being a Roman citizen, most likely died from having his head cut off like a gentleman. Peter, not being a citizen, was crucified upside down. But here in this letter, Paul is writing his last thoughts. It's his last thing to go out. So let's take a look at just part of this chapter today and see what he felt was most important. And I love how he starts in verse 1. He says, you then, my son. He refers to Timothy as his son. And it's not just a casual statement. To the best of our knowledge, Paul never had a family. And so for him, Timothy was like a son to him. He had mentored him. They had gone thousands of miles together on missionary journeys. He had poured into him, taught him, even at one point handing him what was probably his most successful church plant and certainly his largest church, that was Ephesus. He took over that church. Paul loved Timothy like a dear son. So in his final words, what did he want Timothy to know and be reminded of? And he continues on in verse 1. He says, you then, my son, be strong in the grace that is Christ Jesus. The most important thing for him to say in this moment, with a final word, be strong in grace. What was on Paul's mind? Grace. What was most important to him? Grace. What is grace? It's unmerited favor. We don't deserve it. We can't earn it. And yet God loved us so much, he gave it. What does grace say? Well, for so many Christians, they get stuck in the mud, enslaved to this thought that, you know what? Oh, there it is. I I sinned again. I did this thing again. I said something I wasn't supposed to say. I hurt somebody I didn't mean to hurt, or maybe I actually did mean to hurt him in this case. Whatever it is, oh, I messed up again. And down deep, we wallow in the mud and we say, I'm not good enough. And the answer is this, you're not. But you know what grace says? Jesus is. Jesus is good enough. And he loves you so much. He died on a cross for your sins and he rose from the grave so that you don't have to be stuck in the mud in your sin. You too can rise above that and be a new creation born again. His grace says, no matter who you are, where you've been, what you've done, my grace is big enough for you. And Paul's reminding Timothy, at the core of all of this, Timothy, don't forget grace. It can be so easy to beat ourselves up, to to live in condemnation, to shame. Oh, I did it again. I messed up again. It's like three steps forward, one step back. I just constantly do it, and and it destroys our self-worth, and it holds us back. It's like wearing a weight on our leg, and we're just dragging it around. But grace says it doesn't have to happen. Forgiveness is available. If you have a humble heart that repents and confesses, my blood covered your sin, and you can rise out of the disaster of that moment. Grace is amazing. And yet so many Christians live just in chains 
to shame and to guilt. And he says, listen, Timothy, first and foremost, before we get to anything else, don't forget to be strong in grace. You say, but I'm not good enough. And God says, Jesus is. But I'm unrighteous. But you're covered by Christ's righteousness. I'm not perfect. Jesus is perfection covers you so that you can approach the throne of God with boldness and courage. Yes, we're not enough, but Jesus is more than enough. You don't have to live in fear, anxiety, and worry about your standing before God because Jesus stands in front of you and He says, this one's mine. This one's mine. Be strong in grace. But I've brought this up before and I'm going to just keep bringing it up until we all kind of get it. It's so important though. That grace that you have been given, you are expected to give. You have received grace to give grace. We are called to forgive. We are called to love. Doesn't matter who they are. Doesn't matter what they've done. The same grace you have received is the same grace we are called to give unconditionally to others. And I know how it goes. You go, wait, pastor, wait, 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 wait. You don't know what that person did to me. You don't know what they said. They took something from me. Sure, maybe it was my pride, my dignity, a bunch of my reputation. They took it. And I got to get it back. Everything inside of us is wired to get revenge and retaliation in that moment. But grace asks you to pause for a moment. And it says, would you consider something pretty radical here? Counterintuitive. Would you consider forgiving that person? And I'm not talking about wimpy forgiveness here. What am I saying when I say forgiveness? Forgiveness is this, at its core, it means this person owes me nothing. Not even an apology. They owe you nothing. They don't owe you an explanation. They don't owe you an apology. You simply choose to forgive them. Why? Grace. And in that grace, what you say is that I'm going to absorb this pain. I'm going to absorb this thing. The cycle of revenge and retaliation is going to stop with me. I'm not going to allow it to go on. I'm going to forgive you, and you owe me nothing. Now, if you choose to forgive somebody like that, I have a warning for you. It will be a pain unlike any other. Because you are choosing to absorb all of that anger and hatred and pain and instead set them free. But I'll let you in on a secret. You think you're setting them free, but in the end, you're really setting yourself free. Because you are choosing to no longer go down the road of anger, bitterness, cynicism, and hate. Instead, you choose to just love. And isn't that not the love of the cross?
And when you do that, you choose to let this thing that's been rotting in you, you choose to let it die. But there is no other mechanism for us in the New Testament to grow spiritually except that something has to die for freedom to live. That what goes into the grave comes out better on the other side. That with every death there can be a resurrection through Jesus Christ. Is there someone out there you need to forgive? Are you holding on to something that is rotting inside of you? And you think you're getting them back, but it's really just destroying you. And when you refuse to forgive, please hear me on this. When you refuse to forgive and show them grace, it will change you as a person. You will become something you never thought you'd see in the mirror. You will be bitter and cynical and angry. And maybe you know some people like that around you. And it will cause you to walk down roads you don't want to go down. Instead, he's saying, be strong in grace. That's a grace that says that Jesus is more than enough in my life, that I can stand boldly with courage before the throne because Christ's righteousness is enough to forgive my sins, that through the death and resurrection of Jesus, I am forgiven, set free, and reconnected back to God. Amen? Amen. I stand bold in that strength, in that grace. But grace also says that I will stand bold and forgive as I have been forgiven because I refuse to become something I did not mean to become. I have to forgive and expect nothing in return. Is there someone in your life you have to forgive? And if you say for one moment, I can't do this. You know what grace says? It's already been done. I died on a cross for you to demonstrate what that grace looks like. Now take up your cross and follow me. Take up your cross and follow me. There's a verse that I think is so great. Go ahead and put it up, Kylie, if you could. For those we doubt, we say, I don't know if I can do this. In 2 Corinthians, I just love this. He says to me, my grace is for sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. When you are weak, he is strong. That is grace. When you are unrighteous, his righteousness is more than enough to present you before the heavenly Father. His grace is is more than sufficient for you. Step into it and put that at the center of your life. Now, I could talk about grace all day. I love it, but we've got 25 more verses to go and about three hours to do it, so hang tight uh, while we go forward here. <laughs> Someone's new, they're like, did he say that? <laughs> we'll find out. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, 2 Timothy 2. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will be also qualified to teach others. This should not be new for Radiant Church if you've hung around us long enough. What is at the core of everything we do? We multiply disciples, leaders, and churches. That's what we do. And that's what he's telling him here. It's like, yes. Grace is at the center, but don't forget, you need to build up disciples. You need to create future leaders. Why? Because I think we get reminded on a day like today, Mother's Day, with child dedications and, and all that, we have to be sober to the fact that whether we like it or not, we are one generation away from closing our doors if we're not intentionally engaging the next generation and making disciples for Jesus Christ. Amen? Right, amen. amen. And he's reminding them. Find leaders, make disciples, have them teach. That's why we do what we do around here. That's why we say kids are a big deal, because we want to engage that next generation. We refuse to just sit back and let a church die. 
build up. And parents, discipleship happens in the home. Yes, we love to partner with you, and that's all about it. But I get your child for about an hour and a half on the week. Discipleship happens at home. And just as he's looking at Timothy and say, entrust, find leaders, make disciples, he would look at you as a parent and say, make sure you're raising up a next generation of disciples for Jesus Christ. It starts at home. You've got work to do. And so, we continue on as a church, searching for disciples, looking for leaders, and multiplying. He continues in verse 3. He says, join me in suffering. Now, when I read that the first time, I remember stopping there and read it again. I'm like, join me in suffering. And my first thought was, no, thank you. You know what I mean? This is Paul. If you know anything about Paul, I mean, the dude got beaten within an inch of his life more than once. Got locked up in prison more times than I can count. Whipped, beaten. I'm like, uh, not sure I signed up for that. Yet here's Paul saying, join me in suffering. And he says, like a good soldier of Jesus Christ, and we'll get that in a minute. But what's he saying in this? If you're truly going to live like a disciple of Jesus Christ, if you're going to make a concerted effort to say, you know what, this isn't just going to be a Sunday thing for me. I choose to live the way of Christ at my job, at sporting events, school, wherever it may be you're going to come head first against the culture. If you truly choose to live like Jesus and hold to the truth of Scripture and not compromise. Jesus had words of warning for us. He said, if the world hates me, it's going to hate you. There's almost a promise that you're going to face trials and trouble. Nothing about the Christian journey, if we truly live it out, is rainbows and unicorns. It's not a promise of all sunny, happy days. There will be mountaintops, there will be valleys, there will be good days, there will be bad days. How do we navigate those? How do we join in the suffering? Are you ready for that? In fact... I mean, just to convict ourselves, I'm not trying to shame anybody or anything, but are we living in such a way that those who are far from Jesus see something different and unique about us? Does our life confront the culture? Or if we're being honest, I kind of got one foot in and one foot out, and I'm making a series of compromises because you know what? I don't want to stir the pot. And it's a death by paper cuts because we make one compromise here and we make one compromise here. We make one compromise there. And before we know it, a bunch of compromises becomes one big gaping wound. Are you standing up, as he says, like a good soldier of Jesus Christ? Do you even see yourself that way? That's an identity statement. He's looking at him. It's not a metaphor. Remember, this is the same Paul that said, put on the whole armor of Christ. So he understood that we were at war, there was a battle going on, and that there are soldiers for the kingdom. Do you understand that? Do you see your identity as that? Do you see that you're fighting for Jesus Christ? That there is a battle going on? Are you a soldier of the king? Next verse, he says, no one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather they try to please their commanding officer. What's he mean? Well, this is what we've been talking about. This world is full of distractions. 
there are many idols out there trying to get us away from our undevoted devotion of Jesus Christ. There are many things competing for our time and attention. And it can be real easy to get entangled in the worries and the anxieties and the hecticness and the tyranny of this world. And we take our eyes off of Jesus Christ. Remember what happened to Peter when they were walking on water and he took his eyes on Jesus? He started to sink. There's a lot of things competing for our time and attention out there. And he's reminding Timothy, no one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs. Keep your eyes on your commanding officer, Jesus Christ. Don't take your eyes off of him. He's the most important thing. And you're a soldier of Christ. That means that when you became a believer in Jesus Christ, you transferred your citizenship away from this world into the kingdom of God. You took your passport and it no longer says United States of America, it says kingdom of God first. It no longer says Democrat, it says citizen of heaven. Oops, I'm stepping on toes this year. Republican too, by the way. Where is your citizenship and which army are you fighting for? Is it the kingdom of God first or something else? Perhaps you've gotten distracted this election year in civilian affairs. Your passport says kingdom of God, first and foremost. And what are we talking about when we say pleasing our commanding officer? I don't think it's a secret here that Jesus is your commanding officer. Because we just got through talking about grace, Jason. So you're saying, what? I mean, what? I can displease them and I'm no longer saved and, and, and now, you know, everything's bad. And It's not what I'm talking about here. It's Mother's Day, so we can say it. For a lot of us in here, your parents or, or you, you've been around kids long enough to know. I love my kids with all my heart. There's absolutely nothing they can do to step outside of my love. But are there times that they have put a frown on my face? Oh boy. You know what I mean? Have they tried my patience? Made me mad? Oh yeah. Did I ever stop loving them in any of that? Never. Grace says that Jesus loves you no matter what. He loves you. But can you put a frown on Jesus' face? I fear you can. Like any parent. And that's what he's saying here. He's like, you can't earn Jesus' love, but do live your life trying to please him. And let me ask, when you get up in the morning, is that your goal for the day? Is that what's most important to you? Today... My single goal is this. I want to put a smile on Jesus' face. It's not a bad way to start the day. Let's see if we can find another one. Next verse. Similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Reflect on what I'm saying. The Lord will give you insight into this. Jason will too. What does he mean by competing according to the rules? The Greek there also means training. He's talking about living a life of discipline here. Remember, he's talking to Timothy, giving him final advice. And what he's turning the corner to say is like Timothy. Several times Paul calls us to run the race and to run it like we're to win get a victor's crown. And he's saying here, I want you to run the race like one who wants to win. To do that, you're going to have to have a disciplined life. We've talked about this before. Nobody just wakes up one day and says, I think I'm going to go win the marathon and chooses not to do any exercise, not to run, not to get on, go to the weight room or do anything. It doesn't work that way. If you want to win the race, you're going to have to get up every day, put the running shoes on, and you got to go for a run. Whether it's sunny, rainy, cold, or hot, you got to do the work. 
You got to be disciplined. You got to be focused. You got to have intentionality. And the Christian journey demands the same. With all the distractions, with all the things competing for our time, pulling at us, trying to get us to compromise, it will require discipline in our lives to keep our eyes on the Creator. One in my notes, but I, I, I just remember this week, go back, Christianity Today had a great article. And it was just saying, they, they pulled thousands of people, and there was one thing in particular that set aside the genuine followers of Jesus Christ from others, either nominal or unbelievers. There was one thing in particular that stood out. And you know what it was? They were in the Word every single day. That one thing. They chose to get up, open their Bibles, read it, pray, and spend time with God. How about you? Is that how you start your day? If not, I have a challenge for you. Carve out that 30 minutes or so this week. Get in your Bible every day. Take time to pray with God. And tell me at the end of the week that it hurt you. That your life wasn't a little bit better. That you didn't start off your day right. It's amazing when you start off your day with God's word and talking to him. How it centers you towards his will and plans and purposes for your life. It requires discipline and intentionality. And that's all he's saying in this. An athlete, if they want to win, is going to do what they have to do to win. And then he says the farmer should receive the crops. The fair share of the crops reflect on what I'm saying here. And what I want to say is God expects us to work hard. We don't talk about this much in church, but it it shows up in the Bible more than once. God does not approve of laziness. He expects His people to work hard for His kingdom. In fact, in my podcast this week, I told a story of the parable of the talents, if you are familiar with that story. One of the servants chose to bury his one talent. Any idea what Jesus said to him when he returned back? He said, you wicked, lazy servant. And I know that's uncomfortable in today's world, but are you working hard for the kingdom? And he's encouraging, Timothy, you got to do the work. You got to be disciplined and you got to do the work. Last set of verses for today. He says, remember Jesus Christ. Honest to goodness, I could just end right there. That seems good enough right there. You know what I mean? Yeah. What's the sum? Sum it up today, Pastor Jason. Well, remember Jesus Christ. He's raised from the dead. He's descended from David. Notice what he says here. He says, this is my gospel. We'll get to that here in a sec. This is my gospel for which I'm suffering, even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But God's word is not chained. Amen? God's word is not chained. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Amen. But he says, this is my gospel. What's he saying? First and foremost, he said, remember Jesus Christ. What does Christ mean? It means the Messiah, the anointed one. So first and foremost, he's saying, remember, he's the Messiah. What's the second one? Raised from the dead. That is the central message of Christianity. Everything about what we believe hinges on this. No resurrection, no Christianity. Because what it says is that it didn't stop in the grave. He's not just some guy that went up against Rome and the authorities and they killed him like every other martyr. It said that death could not hold him in the grave. That he rose from the grave on the third day. And because he rose from the grave, we too have the promise of new life and resurrection resurrection someday, that the old is gone, the new has come. You can have new life through Jesus Christ. The resurrection's everything. Everything. That's why it's central to his gospel. 
The resurrection reminds us that the same power that conquered the grave lives inside of you for those who are believers in Jesus Christ. That we are more than conquerors because of Jesus Christ. And nothing is impossible for God. My dear friend, if you have not stepped into a relationship with Jesus Christ, it starts here. You do not have to be defined by your past and your failures and your hurts and your pains. Jesus Christ, through grace, can forgive those as he did on the cross, and you can experience new life. You can be born again. You can be a new creation. You can start over. You can be a kingdom citizen, ambassador, and representative. The resurrection is everything. And he says, descended from David. And that's the curious one, isn't, isn't it? But we talked about this at Christmas time when we went through our covenants. And one of them we said was the Davidic covenant. And in the Davidic co covenant, a promise was made by God that out of David's lineage would come a king who would rule the world with an iron scepter, righteousness, and goodness, and love. And we know that king, his name is Jesus. And he is from the line of David. And so at the center of Paul's gospel is this. Jesus the Messiah is your Savior and your King. And I'll say it again because we've talked about this before. For a lot of Christians out there, Jesus is their Savior. I, I love this forgiveness stuff. And I love the heaven thing. Yeah, I mean, I, when I die, I'd like to know that I get to go to heaven. That's, that's pretty cool. I like that. But uh, I don't need a king. I don't need someone else calling the shots in my life. I really, just give me the fire insurance and let's be done. Genuine new life in Jesus Christ, hear me on this, begins when you humbly bow down before your king and surrender your will and your way to him. There is no other way. And anything else is a half gospel. To step into the entire gospel, Paul's gospel here, of Jesus Christ, he must be both your Savior and your King. How about you? Is Jesus Christ your King? My hope and my prayer today, as Paul shares these final words to his protege, that you reflect on them. Do you bask comfortably in the grace that Jesus provides you? That while you say, I'm not good enough, he says, I didn't die on a cross for junk. I love you so much, you were worth the price. And I offer you the gift of salvation freely. Come with a repentant heart, ready to confess your sins, and this gift is yours. Come. And that same grace you've received, do you show others that grace? That love you have received, do you give it freely? Is there someone you need to forgive? And my dear friends, run the race like you want to win. Fight for the king. You are a soldier of the kingdom. You are not defined by this world. Do not let this political year get you, okay? Amen. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Do not be distracted by the culture. And my dear friends, at the core of everything, remember that Jesus is your Savior, but He is also your King. And King Jesus is coming back again someday. Amen? Are you ready? Bow your heads and close your eyes if you could with me. No looking around. Nobody's looking around. It's just me and you right now, okay? If you'd be willing to say, you know what, Pastor Jason, I would love 
to take a moment and pray so that Jesus can be my Savior, my King. I need to take that step. There's not been that moment in life where I drew a line in the sand and said, today I serve the King. Would you be brave enough today and courageous enough today to lift your hand and say, that's me? Yeah? Someone? Anybody? I need that. That's you. Pray this with me silently where you're at. Dear Heavenly Father, I love you. Forgive me of my sins. I want to serve you. Amen. And you think maybe that doesn't seem like a very eloquent prayer. But God is interested in your heart. My first prayer when I came to the Lord was this simple. Here I am, Lord, use me. I didn't know what else to pray. I, I, I didn't know. didn't know the rules. But I believe I'm standing before you today because he honored that prayer. And he will honor yours too. And if you prayed that today, you come find me, you come find Bob, you come find Ben, and we'd like to talk to you further. Happy Mother's Day.